uh, and uh, like there is one more very important eco critic uh, Lawrence Buell and Lawrence Buell says that eco criticism begins from the conviction that the arts of imagination and the study thereof by virtue of the grasp of the power of word story and image to reinforce in living and direct environmental concern can contribute significantly to the understanding of environmental problems the multiple forms of eco degradation that afflict planet earth today so that is what i was speaking about that how literature has the power of the word and how through that through those images through those um, like um, very uh, touching uh, human tales of uh, survival it can bring about these uh, issues and can bring about uh, these environmental issues to the forefront and uh, like uh, if we talk about the beginnings of eco criticism the two very important uh, who have been referred to in the previous slide also the two very important uh, um, writers uh, that is cheryl glotfelty and uh, lawrence buell uh, they contributed very important works uh, cheryl glotfelty is the eco criticism reader and lawrence buell's the environmental in imagination uh, thorough nature writing and formation of american culture so you will see that how eco criticism has uh, come to be uh, like this is a sort of an umbrella term um, and uh, which is um, known in the world by different names also uh, some people refer to as environmental humanities some as green studies and eco poetics and uh, so all of these terms are the re are related terms in a way and uh, like if we although uh, like if we go into the etymology of this word it has been uh, the word ecology it has been derived from the greek words oikos and logos meaning knowledge of the household sciences likewise uh, eco criticism you can also see it has been derived from the words oikos and critis uh, so that is uh, the criticism of the home of the two the uh, environment that we live in uh, the biosphere that we live in now uh, one important work that uh, has been mentioned uh, uh, in the development of eco criticism has been this book silent spring by rachel carson and this has this is considered as a landmark work in the environmental literature uh, because uh, what happened this book uh, you will see that start with it starts with a very pastoral beautiful description of the landscape where uh, the trees uh, there are lush green trees the valley is uh, full of uh, vitality the trees uh, the birds are chirping and all of that and suddenly what happens the whole of the landscape becomes blighted okay uh, there is uh, how people are unable to uh, um, like um, see that vivacity of nature how everything turns into a wasteland so it is how rachel carson uh, very beautifully brings uh, to effect the um, after effects of the use of ddt okay the hazards of using ddt and uh, it is after the publication of this book and because of its popularity that the us government was uh, forced to reconsider its pesticide policy ddt for agricultural uses okay so silent spring uh, it emerged as an epic in the modern green movement now um, as i talked about that you will see that this uh, whole as an academic discipline eco criticism began in america okay so initially it was uh, american centric but later on how it went its popularity it went on throughout the world and like how um, now this particular concept or this whole thing is popular in the whole world so uh, but it essentially it uh, as a discipline as an academic discipline it began with the formation of esle esle is association for the study of literature and environment and this was founded in 1992 at the conference in nevada uh, to act as a platform of sharing ideas and studies concerning environment and literature so uh, like uh, how uh, scott uh, slovic scott slovic was the first uh, uh, president of this association and uh, cheryl grotfelty whom we had referred to in our previous slides is also the co-founder of esle and esle is also publishing uh, its journal uh, by the name of isle that is i s l e that is interdisciplinary studies in literature and environment uh, it is the flagship journal of esle 
Now, as I said, that assay is uh, it became such an important. Force in the field of uh, environment and literature, and uh, that uh, how it opened up uh, chapters in uh, throughout the world. That is, uh, we have Esle Australia, we have Esle Canada, we have Esle India, and the Indian chapter, the present Indian chapter, uh, is called as EFSLE. That is Ecosophical Foundation of the for the study of literature and environment. This is the Indian chapter which engages with the role of literature in creating environmental awareness. And I am also uh, luckily the member of uh, EFSLE. Uh, so, um, as I said, that uh, the beginnings of uh, eco criticism or this environment and literature uh, interaction, and as you can by now uh, very easily decipher, that this is an um, uh, interdisciplinary sort of a uh, discipline. And uh, so it, uh, it has its origins in the nature writings of the 19th century American writers who celebrated nature and wilderness in their writings. And these three writers, you all must be really knowing very well, that is Ralph uh, Waldo Emerson and uh, uh, Margaret Fuller, Henry David Thoreau, uh, so, particularly, I will speak about uh, uh, Thoreau uh, and his work, Walden. Uh, this work he composed, he had written uh, after he had stayed for two years in uh, near the Walden Pond. So, it is about his dealings with the wilderness, about nature, and how uh, he uh, is of the view that how um, human beings should live in harmony with nature. And that is essentially the uh, concern of uh, eco-criticism that is to instill that harmony between uh, human beings and nature. Now, uh, we have been till now talking about uh, the American beginnings or the American leanings of uh, eco-criticism, but um, uh, such studies or such disciplines were also developing in England also. And in England, this particular uh, branch of studies, it started with um, as green studies, okay? And uh, as the eco-critics, uh, the eco-critics, inspiration from the American transcendentalist writers. Likewise, the, um, the uh, English eco-critics, they took their inspiration from the British romantic poets like Wordsworth, Shelley, Keats, and all of these poets uh, because they were essentially celebrating nature in their poetry. So uh, the uh, first uh, important eco-critic in England uh, is Jonathan Bate, uh, who is the founding figure of Green Studies and his landmark work is Romantic Ecology, Wordsworth, and the Environmental Tradition. And uh, a significant work is Lawton Hoops, the Green Studies reader from Rom eco-criticism. Now, um, uh, I will, as I'm referring again and again to uh, these two names, that of Jill Gottfeldt, um, the um, female eco-critic, and the uh, another one is Lawrence Buell. Okay. So, uh, these are the two eco-critics who had significantly charted the uh, scope of eco-criticism. And uh, Lawrence Buell uh, um, I, uh, by Lawrence Buell, but it, this is what he speaks of in the book, The Future of Environmental Criticism, uh, wherein he talks about uh, two ways of The first, as we have already discussed, is what is focused on nature and the writings of uh, and the wilderness fiction. Uh, for example, uh, initially, they essentially focused on the American transcendentalist writer, writer. and uh, that is how they are essentially uh, these eco critics are focusing on those writers who are celebrating nature. And the second wave of eco critics uh, is dealing with public interests of environmental issues like environmental justice. Now, when we talk about environmental justice, actually, uh, this particular um, uh, phrase, environmental justice, becomes uh, very important in today's scenario because what we find is that uh, the imperialistic powers and the rich people uh, and uh, the developing nations, uh, or rather the developed nations, they are the ones who have exploited the environment the most. But 
what happens is the um, uh, it is the poor people it is the um, uh, like uh, undeveloped and or the developing countries and the um, developing uh, people who are the worst um, like affected by the environmental wastes and uh, environmental uh, havocs okay because and how they are uh, these man made environmental habits that i am being talk i'm talking about for example in uh, our um, last for in our greed for progress and um, today as we see that ours is a, a society um, and particularly the western people how they are uh, uh, talking about or uh, and development wherein they are clearing forests okay and they are using uh, chemicals to, um, uh, to maybe to accelerate the growth of the crops and the other thing they are destroying the natural ecosystems they are uh, like uh, how they are uh, totally uh, ripping off the womb of the earth taking out minerals and so and particularly countries like africa and all how they were uh, ripped off their um, uh, national resources their minerals and uh, their other national resources and so but they are the ones uh, the uh, advanced countries the western countries take advantage of these things but the poor people how they get affected by it there are oil spills there are these chemical usages and how they are direct the poor people they are directly affected by it because their waters becomes become contaminated okay there are leakages from the factories and how uh, how thousands and hundreds of people they die and they get affected so how this sub field of eco criticism is focusing on environmental justice and this is what how from sheer celebration of nature and wildness how eco criticism has moved on to discuss these issues of environmental justice and particularly these issues of, of environmental justice have been taken up by post colonial writers and uh, because post colonialism as you already uh, are aware of how colonizers uh, have exploited the natives the native people so post colonial eco criticism is dealing with that not only the people that have got affected by the process of colonization but how the native ecosystems have also been affected by the process of colonization uh, so this is what um, they are dealing with then we have uh, uh, this very important writer uh, by the name rob nixon and uh, rob nixon in his book slow violence and the environmentalism of the poor he journeying to light environmental issues which are otherwise not easily perceptible and uh, he uh, and this is a quote from his book he writes in a world permeated by issues yet unseen or imperceptible violence imaginative writings can help make the unapparent appear making it accessible and tangible by humanizing drawn out threads inaccessible to the senses writing can challenge perceptual habits that downplay and damage so violence in it and bring into imaginative focus appreciate that you sense the collaboration okay so he is uh, Nixon is establishing uh, the importance told by the, the writers and how the, the writings uh, can actually challenge the uh, um, this uh, whole effect of uh, slow violence because what happens is when uh, slowly and gradually uh, so because of the toxic gases or because of the seepages of these chemicals into water it, this is not immediately perceptible for example if uh, uh, like there is uh, an earthquake or if there is some other fire or something what happens these damages are uh, brought about on the horizon they can be seen uh, and they are perceptible but these the slow violence about which rob like dixon is talking about what happens this is actually uh, it is uh, not visible uh, uh, in in a common way in a common sense so uh, it is the um, um, uh, like, like the uh, it is the responsibility of the writer how to make this unseen and imperceptible violence appear that is what rob nixon is speaking about 
Then uh, he's also talking about the role of the writer activists uh, that is there in, in this uh, area. And uh, so you will find that they are also environmental activists. Although I have over here uh, given only three names, uh, but uh, if you would just search on the Google, you will find the, all the important novelists or writers who are um, writing uh, or the eco critics. They are um, essentially also environmental activists, and that is that that is their activism which has led uh, to uh, for them to write these books. All. You know, for example, if you take such a writer like Mark Edward, the Canadian novelist, um, she's an environmental activist and she is, of course, in all her novels, she is talking about um, the importance of nature and in some of her, of her novels, she's also talking about the apocalyptic vision, how the world, because these are the things these writers are engaging in, in order to hide this particular uh, uh, like uh, crisis that we are facing, and uh, so uh, we have one such writer, Sarah Weaver, and we have Arun Gopal. So Karen Weaver, Karen Karen Weaver is a Nigerian writer in Mandal language, and he was for the rights of Ovi people who suffered environmental degradation of their lands due to the petroleum pollution. So how uh, is the Ovi people? The companies like she are doing, they are carrying out, um, taking out these oil and all of that, and there is this uh, spillage of oil, and how it is slowly, and uh, he calls it as a sort of a genocide because it is eradicating the whole of this, uh, people, this tribe of the Ogoni people, and uh, because he had written and uh, spoken about and discussed on this issue, what happened was that uh, he was executed. For the Yes, we have a Kenyan uh, writer, Wangari Mathai, and she is also the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004. And she is from the movement and the movement and peace preserve forests. And uh, her most memorable work is Armwood, it's in a uh, memoir. And uh, so there also she is talking about how. Uh, um, even a single person can make a change, how people can get voted, how uh, environmental, um, uh, just through uh, uh, activities of uh, plantation and all of that. The moment I'm reminded of uh, come from, uh, is also coming from uh, this uh, uh, Indian scenario, uh, you must have heard of Chipko movement, okay? And Chipko movement, uh, the word Chipko itself is um, the fact that is how these women they uh, embraced uh, the trees uh, in order to preserve them, okay? So, uh, all such movements throughout the world you will find that have been uh, uh, fought for in order to conserve environment. And another environment activist is Arundhati Roy. Uh, you must have all known uh, about her novel, uh, God of Small Things. But uh, over here, I am not uh, focusing on God of Small Things, but rather her work as justice. Uh, this is a prose uh, writing, and uh, she, over here in this, she is talking about how a sort of environmental disaster can come uh, because of the use of nuclear weapons and how uh, the entire uh, humanity, entire civilization can uh, get uh, erased if we uh, if we do this. And she calls this as, um, uh, as a great uh, foolish act uh, to do on the part of any uh, uh, country or any government, okay? And uh, besides that, Roy has been very vocal. Uh, she has been uh, speaking against the construction of dams, particularly the Narmada uh, uh, Dam. And uh, she has... Um, like how uh, this construction of dams, they uh, affect the uh, local people and the local ecosystems. This is what she is um, discussing about. Now I uh, move on to um, uh, this 
I focus because this area is so vast. Each country, each literature has its own aspect of eco criticism. And there is the Canadian writers, the American writers, the the Australian writers. But over here, I would particularly focus on um, eco criticism and how it developed in India. Okay, so uh, because um, uh, we have already uh, talked about the whole uh, origins of eco criticism, how it originated in India. in uh, america uh, and all of that but then how uh, these kind of tendencies um, then finally uh, spread on to all the other parts of the world and if we particularly talk about the indian scenario so although in india there have been and if we talk about the indian english writing and there have been uh, novelists like raja rao and his novel kanthapura then there is r k narayan his all of these uh, novels wherein he is discussing about the uh, malgudi region so over here these texts cannot be particularly taken as eco critical texts although they can be analyzed through the eco critical uh, lens uh, that is another thing but they are not entirely uh, dedicated to uh, environmental issues uh, they are eco critical from the perspective that they are based in certain uh, places and those places they give a character to that those novels like kanthapura or the, how the malgudi does in all of the narayan's novels okay then uh, there are writers like bhavani bhattacharya mention of the bengal famine and there are there is of course a reference to uh, and uh, in kamla markandeya's nectar in a sea in how she climbs towards the garden and uh, maintains her own uh, kitchen garden and things like that but uh, again these are not full full fledged eco critical texts okay and then we move on to uh, writers like arundhati roy uh, who who might already mentioned uh, about a uh, book elder of infinite justice and then there is mahashweta devi now mahashweta devi can also be called as a writer activist because uh, she has again been uh, trying to not only preserve the forests but the tribes uh, the tribals as well because uh, these uh, forests are the dwelling places of uh, um, these uh, tribals and how she is asking for and striving to uh, preserve uh, the uh, natural habitat of these uh, tribals and uh, particularly if you refer to her work um, uh, derodactyl uh, uh, puran sahay yeah. and tha that is uh, and a significant work that uh, that is by uh, mahashweta devi then um, i move on to uh, now uh, the most significant writers that i finally move on to are amitav ghosh and sara joseph okay because it is with the coming of these novelists like amitav ghosh and sara joseph that eco criticism achieved a new dimension in in indian literary scenario and uh, um, like in one of the interviews that amitav ghosh gave to alessandro vescovi uh, he talks about uh, the responsibilities of the writer towards Um, these issues and he says and i quote uh, from what he had uh, spoken he he is i do writers of my generation have a duty to address issues of the environment when we look at writers of the 30s and 40s we ask where did you stand on that in the future they will look at us and say where did you stand on the environment i think this is absolutely the fundamental question of our time okay so this is how uh, ghosh is um, nailing on this particular thing that how writers have this, this responsibility being the writers they have this uh, duty to address uh, to the issues of uh, and he says that if we will not do this uh, the future generations will ask us that what where what i stand on uh, on the environmental issues amitav ghosh i do, i think that most of you must be familiar with uh, so really uh, he doesn't need any introduction these are the important works that have been um, written by amitav ghosh and my focus will be uh, on the hungry tide okay although he has written this great derangement also this is one of his prose works wherein also he is talking about that how uh, not many uh, great works have been written by uh, uh, on climate change okay and this he calls as the great derangement okay that is a total derangement of 
uh, writings dealing with climate change and this is such an important issue and the people should and writers should take up this issue in their writings uh, mainstream writings that is what he says and so we will try to uh, make an incredible reading of his novel the hungry tide uh, and this is how i will try to show you all that how uh, literary uh, artists or writers they contemplate out environmental issues uh, in uh, through their writings okay and how literature uh, plays a role in that so um uh, now uh, moving on uh, to this particular novel that is the hungry tide uh, you will see that uh, over here you can see that how um, uh, amitav ghosh uh, is talking about this area of sundarbans i have for your uh, convenience i have uh, like uh, posted this uh, um, map of sundarbans you can see how these uh, are the islands trailing into ocean okay and how beautifully if i talk about this map not many people will take interest into this map not many people will understand what region is this but see the power of literature this is how um, amitav ghosh describes this uh, novel and he says the islands are the trailing threads of india's fabric the ragged fringe of her sari the archel that follows her half wetted by the sea and look at uh, at the map okay so you see that how beautifully um, uh, a writer like amitav ghosh had has described the uh, sundarbans uh, and uh, he has called that, that as a fringed archel okay of the sari and uh, it is half wetted by the sea it seems like that okay so this is the kind of the power of uh, literature which can ev evoke uh, and which can really uh, make you uh, to think about uh, the regions which you have not seen or uh, maybe you have not come to know about that to know about more about that so uh, then uh, like talking about Uh, this novel uh, this novel is set in the backdrop of uh, sundarbans and uh, sundarbans as you all might be knowing that this is uh, a very um, uh, of course a very fragile ecosystem and how over there the in the uh, flow the jo r and the bhata of the um, uh, ocean what happens is these um, uh, islands they are made and unmade okay uh, because as as the tides uh, that it is the high tide uh, many of these islands they get submerged into sea so um, this is uh, how he is talking about and describing this immense archipelago of islands and he says every day thousands of acres of forest disappear under water only to re emerge later so of course um, amitav ghosh is talking about not only about this ecosystem but he is also talking about those under privileged people who are living in these regions of the world in this region and the sundarbans as you know uh, uh, like uh, half of the sundarbans lies with india and uh, major port of it lies with uh, bangladesh okay so how it is the people their hardships that they are facing and uh, how their interaction with the environment that that is what he has discussed in this novel and uh, like to uh, appear it more interesting i have posted some um, pictures also uh, the top one is uh, showing the mangrove forests because this is why they are known as sundarbans okay sundri trees uh, the uh, mangroves or trees uh, okay that uh, that is the main uh, characteristic of uh, these islands and uh, of course the royal bengal tiger and uh, there is another um, not much known um, creature and that is the river dolphins or the iravans so how uh, uh, amitav ghosh has excelled as a writer that he has been able to bring all these issues uh, into one platform in this uh, particular novel okay so uh, uh, and like uh, of course as i talked about that uh, this particular been um, the perspective of eco post colonial eco criticism and uh, how uh, the colonizers how they have uh, exploited open spaces and uh, how they have established um, uh, 
and uh, these far off places and how this port canning was established on the banks of river matla and then um, how foolish this was as an activity because uh, how it was open to the furies of nature and the how uh, and within 5 years how the town was um, okay so this a particular novel um, that is uh, the hungry tide it follows the journey of young bengali american marine biologist piali roy who come to the tide country in search of rare river dolphins uh, these are iravati or the gangetic dolphins that i spoke about and uh, of course this is also about the whole issue of the local versus the local this is um, kanai and pia they are the global people they are, are the outsiders who have come over here for pia as a researcher she is a marine biologist marine zoologist and she is researching on uh, gangetic dolphins and kanai has course come um, as uh, for uh, some work that aunt has called uh, him off and there is this another character by the name of fokir fokir is the uh, local over here he has come to live in harmony with nature so nature doesn't have any um, uh, like um, harm uh, from him from uh, from person like fokir it is only the outside who harm uh, the uh, environment uh, but uh, how the governments and the uh, policy makers they fail to see that because these underprivileged people like fokir who are described as uh, refugees uh, and how they have ultimately landed all, all over onto this place and they have been living here for many many years and uh, how they are being uh, asked to be uh, evacuated from this particular place because the government thinks that uh, nature is getting harmed because of them because of them so uh, but um, like how these people so it is not about just about nature that um, uh, that uh, amitav ghosh is speaking about he is also talking about these underprivileged people like for okay and um, so as i talked about that how pia and kanai they are established as outsiders from the beginning of the novel and then there is very important episode in the novel uh, which is how because these people these local they are constantly threatened by tigers over in this region and there are hundreds of them are multi tigers they are predated so even when going in the fields um, in or catching fishes or um, maybe uh, moving about so how their movement is so very difficult because of this constant threat from the tigers so uh, they don't understand the environmental repercussions of uh, burning a tiger but um, like if you have to look from the perspective of Uh, these people that what so like this is what uh, amitav ghosh has tried to do and so uh, pia on the other hand because she is a researcher working on these uh, wildlife creatures and how she is shocked when these villagers they are burning the tiger but fokir who otherwise has a deep knowledge of uh, the environment uh, of his surroundings but he too um, uh, participates in the burning of this um, tiger okay so uh, like we have this is a very complex issue that uh, amitav ghosh has uh, touched in this particular novel and um, then uh, of course there is this whole politics of conservation uh, that is um, uh, there is a reference to this moriapi uh, massacre that took place in in this region uh, of the sundarbans uh, that how these people were evacuated um, or tried to be evacuated and like uh, police open fire and hundreds of them killed uh, what killed over and so uh, the governments are failing to address the problems of these unfortunate people and he also makes to debate uh, about the issues of uh, the animal conservation at the cost of the human living he thinks that animal conservation and natural conservation is essential this just not be at the cost of the human lives because what the government is doing is on one hand it is uh, propagating um, uh, eco tourism projects where uh, it is um, having or creating unnecessary burden on the environment by um, um, making money by calling these people for tourism and the people are staying there and so all of that so that is where the real harm lies the real harm doesn't lie, lie if the tribals or if the 
native people are living over here because they live in harmony with nature okay and uh, uh, like how these so called uh, environmental conservation is uh, the government particularly uh, to speak about uh, they don't have enough knowledge uh, of how to conserve um, nature how to conserve these places and so one such episode has been highlighted when uh, the, the uh, uh, forest officer forest guards they are moving in with their motor boats and one of the dolphin calf uh, gets killed okay so uh, it is the half knowledge or uh, very little knowledge that these people these forest guards or these forest officers have about uh, nature and the conservation policies okay and uh, so if you see that how literature is actually very uh, essential and like how it plays a very very important role in creating awareness because after the publication of this novel the hungry tide it it uh, created such a uh, such a pressure on the government that this sahara india project of eco tourism was halted by the central ministry of environment and forests and it was forced to abort the project okay and so what uh, amitav khosh is trying to convey is that uh, true conservation is only possible if we take locals into consideration and with their help and cooperation now uh, i move on to uh, another writer that is sara joseph and um, her novel gift in green and uh, sara joseph is uh, she is as i said that most of these writers are she is also an environmental activist uh, a feminist writer from kerala and um, this particular novel has been written originally in malayalam and has been translated from malayalam into english by a walson thampu and the walson tampu is a sensitive and insightful portrayal uh, and uh, like you will find that this particular novel a gift in green is a very sensitive and insightful portrayal of arthi arthi uh, is a fictional uh, island uh, a very vibrant and lush green island uh, with its uh, fascinating flora and fauna and uh, with its meandering backwaters and waterways and this peace and tranquility is challenged by consumerism development and modernity so these are essentially uh, uh, the main uh, things which are uh, um, some way or the other leading to the environmental crisis uh, the consumer ridden society of uh, the modern times okay uh, that how we have become uh, so consumer ridden that we only want to have the best things for us we don't pay attention uh, uh, that these uh, products are coming to us at what cost of environment okay so this is what these writers they are trying to uh, bring out the focus on uh, to make us must understand how what at what cost these things are coming to us okay and this uh, particular novel is dexterously dealing with the, the fascinating relationship of the people with their land and how human greed and control uh, and uh, uh, exploit environment can disrupt the balance of fragile ecosystems and the result can be disastrous now um, i will give you a little bit idea about all although i know that all of you have uh, and you know about kerala and how it is described as god's own country and uh, it lies between the lakshadweep sea and the western ghats in the southern peninsula and it has a very unique character and why it is so lush green uh, it is in the very fact that it is fed by 44 rivers and a chain of backwaters uh, which uh, nourish this sunny green state and um, urbanization and consumerism has polluted the land air and water of uh, this particular state now if we go on to this um, issues we have been affecting over a period of time uh, particularly you all must be uh, aware of uh, or familiar with uh, the floods that came over in 2018 and how um, many people died and a um, uh, much property and uh, even the, the landscape what affected because of that and uh, so uh, if we talk about how it all started so again from the perspective of post colonial eco criticism you will understand that how colonizers cleared the tropical forests of the area for plantation of tea and coffee so mind you tea and coffee are not the local uh, um, yields of or local crops of this place they have been 
uh, like brought about by the colonizers because these regions were fit for growing tea and coffee and not only that uh, the most the thing uh, the uh, particularly which destroyed the natural ecosystem was rubber plantation and uh, which destroyed the local ecosystems and thus came to be known as the devil's milk okay and uh, and of course kerala again is also a uh, uh, wreck with uh, the extensive construction of dams which has led to the destruction of nearly 350, 350 kilometers of uh, evergreen forest because besides this there is also the issue of the sand mining for construction and uh, how sand mining can actually um, change the landscape uh, like it can there is uh, the other day i was watching the television and uh, over there in australia it was being described that how so much of sand mining at certain places has taken place that uh, whole islands have been wiped off that is the kind of extensive um, because how the sand mafias land mafias they have been uh, doing this sand mining okay and um, uh, like how uh, kerala is having uh, this uh, protected wetlands uh, that is vembanad and the ashtamudi and uh, because these wetlands are being filled for construction and because of that uh, how it is exposed to uh, floods and things like that so now moving on to the novel Uh, that is gifting green uh, the novel begins uh, again with a very pastoral uh, description of uh, this uh, fictional uh, Uh, island that is Athi, and um, pe oh, people over here were living in harmony with nature, and um, nature, uh, and particularly water is the most significant part of uh, nature, and how it has been often been described as life giving. Okay, and uh, how this region yielded a rich harvest of kolaki rice as the paddy fields were harvested with the fresh water of the region. and again as in um, uh, hungry tide over here also uh, people who were downtrodden who were uh, evacuated from other place they had nowhere else to go about so these were the people who originally got settled in athi and they were the um, uh, people who suffered from oppression hunger alienation abuse and discrimination okay and uh, so the novel is essentially unfolding through two major characters dinakaran and the other one is kumaran uh, dinakaran uh, is the one of course the uh, hero uh, he respects his land and uh, nature and has a deep understanding of it on the other hand it is with the coming of the kumaran that uh, the problems they start with because he is the one who has big designs he wants to um, make money and that is why he has returned back to athi and uh, so uh, he exploits nature and its resources for power and money thus pushing athi and its people to extinction he found the gullible and innocent people of athi and takes over their land so that is what his designs are he has taken uh, forcibly and uh, by fooling the locals he has taken over the land of the people and then he has uh, big designs for construction so he is uh, destroying the mangrove forests okay he is destroying the uh, wetlands uh, okay and so that is why not only Uh, he is uh, um, uh, making these poor people suffer but rather he is also destroying uh, nature and desecrating nature okay so uh, kumaran's arrival has been um, uh, described as he violates the age old silence of athi as he was hailed with a deafening burst of crackers that shook the place that is his very arrival how uh, it has been described in this novel and so uh, it is uh, kumaran as i said who brings a lot of uh, turmoil in the lives of the people and uh, these people had never known greed enmity hoarding or any other form of evil so uh, like um, that is how everything is for example the religion and uh, religious beliefs uh, they are also in uh, the, uh, by the modern man they are associated with uh, wealth okay so like uh, kumaran uh, he um, uh, tells the people that how he is uh, going to um, like construct a new temple for his uh, for their deity okay uh, thampuran so he is uh, bringing heaps of gold to construct a new temple of thampuran and he says that it has to be guarded against the thieves now 
now you have to remember that these people of the of the displaced athi they are very simple hearted people and Uh, from the very beginning they have not known uh, such concepts of theft and anything and they uh, like uh, for them everything was open and it, it was for all they have never understood the concepts of hoarding and things like that so uh, i will read out a passage from the novel wherein he says no door in athi had locks or bolts safe as in a mother's womb guarded by the warm sentinel of encircling waters athi had stood secure for ages so this is how kumaran is having a very negative impact on the people of athi okay so not just the environment of athi kumaran tries to ruin the culture and the belief systems of its people as well now uh, uh, of course because uh, this particular uh, novel has been uh, located in kerala and uh, in this fictitious town of uh, of or sorry uh, fictitious uh, island of athi so what is abandoned over here so that is why it is uh, um, made as the central metaphor in the novel and uh, how uh, the humans over the centuries have relentlessly exploited the water resources and have polluted the lakes rivers and oceans with all possible kinds of waste and while doing so we have remained oblivious to the dangers that we have exposed our own selves to The novel also discusses the impact of globalization on the environment and the irreversible damage caused by anthropogenic activities that is man made activities okay so uh, human activities how they have affected uh, and have done irreversible damage to uh, the environment and in one of the passages in the novel shelja uh, one of the characters in the novel is shocked to see the state of the lake behind the hospital now listen to these lines that i have taken from uh, the novel uh, laden with the stench of the wind uh, uh, the wind was heavy beside placentas and murdered fetuses shelja saw emerging from innumerable cracks and crevices severed limbs swabs oozing with pus black clots decomposed flame chemical agents plastic bottles and bags garbage okay so this is what she uh, encounters and she smell uh, when uh, she goes near this uh, pond uh, behind the hospital okay that how the human waste and human uh, excreta pus and blood and everything has gone into those these water bodies and have really polluted and desecrated these water bodies and there is also uh, uh, like there are certain very scientific things that have been dealt with in this novel uh, wherein uh, there is this mention of endosulfan okay and uh, which is uh, how it has if very adversely affected the uh, uh, agriculture and the land um, because the land over here is not the ordinary land it is the land which um, uh, nourishes uh, people which, which is producing this uh, wheat uh, very good quality wheat that grow, uh, and the sorry the rice that grows over there and kumaran and his people they pollute the land air and water of athi and make it possible for the people to farm make it impossible for the people to farm or fish which is the main source of livelihood and lead the land and its people towards extinction okay so like when uh, uh, kumaran has used endosulfan uh, in um, uh, the on the land and in the wetlands what happened it has not only killed all the fish that was there it has also polluted the land and that is how these people who are uh, the um, uh, people of the earth or who are the people who are the worst sufferers who are the poor people or whom uh, um, uh, even rob nixon has also referred to and how these are the people who suffer because of this kind of activity and they destroy the ecosystem by filling the wetlands burying and destroying the mangroves and poisoning the fish and the prawns now uh, there is uh, as i said a lot of environmental activism that can be seen uh, in um, this particular novel uh, taking place um, while uh, sara jones is talking about the plight of these three villages uh, one is chakkam kadam the other one is guruvayur and then the, the third one is kadampuram so all of the chakkam kadam what is happening there is these uh, effluents or the chemical pollutants which are going into the canals and the water 
water bodies and they are polluting the underground water and uh, even the open water bodies uh, like lakes and ponds and things like that and the rivers and this water which is found in so much of abundance in kerala is finally um, uh, like it is rendered unfit for human consumption okay likewise uh, in this uh, particular village of guru guru vayur um, it is this is this particular place is also um, uh, thousands and uh, people are coming for pilgrim pilgrimage and so there is an inadequate uh, facility for toilets and that is uh, how the human excreta is uh, finally landing up in these water bodies and it's polluting the land and the water and this is ultimately giving rise to diseases okay and the kadapuram has been particularly there is this mention of the whole sand mafia thing that i was talking about sand mining uh, ki wajah se what happened that uh, there is the change of the landscape okay uh, the, for example uh, a small island or the uh, maybe uh, a structure that was there near the uh, pond or a um, river or anything what happens because of the sand mafias continuous mining of the sand from those these places how the landscape it is affected and it gets changed okay and uh, so um, uh, finally um, we have been shown that how uh, nature reclaims itself okay it is uh, not only the preserver it can act as a destroyer also so uh, when we say that we have to protect environment it is we have to protect environment for ourselves because it is we who will get annihilated we as humans okay nature has a way out it it can reclaim itself so how in the novel also it has been described that how there is a, a, a rainstorm and there is this whole um, thing everything breaks off all the structures that have been made by uh, kumaran and how everything gets uh, totally is annihilated so it is uh, and how again uh, aarti is, is it achieves its own serenity it achieves its own um, like um, the wildness that it has previously if for example in today's scenario of the covid we are also being uh, talking about that how nature is reclaiming itself it is although the human beings are suffering but nature has a way out as i said that how things are getting back to uh, being uh, air uh, birds skies and the birds are chirping and everything so likewise uh, nature destroys everything and then it reclaims itself how uh, aathi like it achieves its all the previous uh, sort of a, a pastoral quality that it had um, in the beginning of uh, things so the novel gives a warning to the humanity that we should learn to respect nature otherwise we can get annihilated by its furies aathi is finally uh, restored to its primeval beauty but not before it accepts the sacrifice of dinakaran uh, who breathes his last in his mother's lap okay so these are my concluding remarks of the lecture that how these both these novels uh, that is gift in green and hungry tide so this is what i say try to talk about that how um, uh, how we can contemplate uh, about environmental issues through literature how these writers like sara joseph and amitav ghosh they have uh, emphasized nature as a living entity capable of interacting and giving back what it receives from humans and thus any human onslaught or environment is duly returned by devastation and destruction brought about by nature and its fury the texts have the potential of immense societal impact as they provide us with a lesson of living in harmony with nature lest it might be too late to save the world in which we inhabit okay and uh, th these uh, um, these two novels likewise all eco critical literature it succeeds in raising important ecological issues pertaining to fragile ecosystems and it asks for sustainable measures of environmental conservation and uh, these texts they play an important role in generating awareness about sustainable and ethical ways of development lest we succumb to total annihilation and through these novels sara joseph and amitav ghosh have been able to sensitize their readers about these unique and diverse ecosystems of sundarbans and kerala with its backwaters rivers streams and lakes okay so that is all from my side i hope that uh, you liked the lecture and you uh, could um, understand what have been the points that i have been trying to raise
thank you ma'am thank you so much ma'am uh, thank you for okay. uh, enlightening uh, the view uh, uh, of uh, eco criticism and viewing uh, the fictions through the uh, eco criticism lens uh, with your permission uh, we can have some questions ma'am yes definitely i would love to entertain your questions okay 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 ma'am um, um, students can ask uh, their questions if you can unmute one by one but please anyone with the question ah uh, huma yes ah uh, jab tak ye log question soch rahe hain i have one observation i don't have any question ha uh, since you are an expert in criticism it is this is yahia here uh so since you are an expert in eco uh -huh, I, i can see you yes uh, and uh, this is your field uh, i have one observation that if we look into the writings of kuratul and hader we can find a lot of eco critical uh -huh. concerns acha yeah. yeah. okay okay although i have read some of the novels of kuratul and hader aag ka darya used to teach uh, river of fire and uh, then there is this uh, fire flies in the mist but uh, i don't know why i it didn't cross my mind so it's a, in a lightning observation i appreciate that yeah 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 when i was talking about this fire flies in the mind was was in my mind because uh, usme okay. usme usko if you look at that novel fire flies in the more to usme you can Mist. find lot of eco critical aspects more especially the time the the hero and the heroines are in the sundarban region and they met all the sundarban people the people residing in the sundarban region, hardships the way they were facing their the life the way they were collecting their foods so there is lot of concern environmental concern there in that novel uh, apart from that there were a few short stories by kuratul uh, and hader uh, for example titled as photographer something there are a few stories um, which one pardon photographer uh, there is one novel called uh, kiraftar so so all Achha. these novels and non short stories have lot of environmental concerns uh, in in those uh, writings और जब आप बता रहे हैं कि सुंदरबन के एरिया में जो हीरोइन एंड वो दिखाते हैं बिकॉज दे आर एक्चुअली फ्रीडम फाइटर्स एंड हाउ दे आर सीक्रेटली मीटिंग एट दैट प्लेस दिस इज वॉट यू आर रेफरिंग टू एंड हाउ शी comes over to observe uh, those uh, the um, uh, travails and the hardships faced by the people who are living in the sansundarban areas um, uh, and uh, the uh, stories that you are talking about i have not read those uh, i will definitely uh, like refer to those and yeah. i will try to uh, like write down maybe something on that <laughs> okay. thank you so much you are most welcome yeah yeah it was a pleasure uh, by way of this lecture to uh, come to see you after a long long time and uh, um, thanks a lot for giving the, me this opportunity to interact with you all and uh, or koi questions kisi ko puchna sakit there is some some question perhaps sir shahbaz wants to ask something oh uh, shahbaz shahbaz if you can unmute and ask okay and question it should be the question not every please thank shabaz perhaps shabaz is unable to mute ha wo unmute nahi kar raha hai shayad unko he is unable to hear us or uh, perhaps he is having problem in unmuting or something okay he is he is coming he is, he is using his ear phone he is coming okay okay that's good good afternoon ma'am very good afternoon shahbaz ma'am 
Ma'am, my question is about this uh, these capitalist uh, conglomerate. Okay. I think over the past the past couple of years they have been very successful in uh, de devising a very harsh scapegoating narrative that uh, uh, whether be a vegan or not to be a vegan that by eating meat you are contributing to the climate change, and they say that this is the most uh, what can be say uh, this is the this is the cause which contributes to. Uh, increase the global climate footprints, but in reality, it isn't. It's the oil companies which are at seventy yes, yes. percent. Yes, yes, the meat in yes, yes. Okay, so I'm meat, your question, ma'am. Just in just a mo uh, just give me a minute. I will conclude. Okay, okay, okay. The oil company account for seventy one percent of the global uh, carbon footprint emissions, while the meat industry in itself is thirteen percent. So, are they very successful in creating this scapegoat narrative where we are just fighting each other to be or not to be a vegan, and they are successful in exploiting the environment? Or, uh, if it is so, why aren't the climate activists attacking the big conglomerates like Shell, Exxon, Mobil, etc.? That's my question. Okay, okay. So, um, Shabazz, a very wonderful question and nice observations that you have made. Uh, so, yes, you are very right. They are trying to um, um, make a scapegoat, um, of course, because uh, as I said that I personally, um, as uh, maybe if I am a sort of an environmental activist, if you say so, so um, I also th think like Amitav Ghosh that human uh, should be given priority uh, in any way. Uh, because because it is um, environment should be conserved, but not at the cost of uh, the human being. And like how particularly when we are focusing on uh, um, the um, being uh, on veganism and all of these things, there are so many other things. For example, the uh, destruction of forests, the uh, um, uh, construction of uh, high-rise buildings that are taking place. Or the oil spills, uh, for example, uh, that as uh, Kensei Roviva has also talked about. This Shell uh, company, how it was responsible for the, uh, he calls it as a genocide that it occurred and how the people, the only people, they were wiped off uh, because of the, these multinational companies. And uh, they are, in a way, trying to uh, evade that and trying to focus on uh, this particular uh, issue of uh, veganism. Okay, This is all, to, all together going on to a, another platform because what happens is criticism is having so many issues. There are some writers going to uh, other extremes. For example, there's this whole debate of ecofeminism and things like that. So um, um, I am not an uh, extremist in that sense. Okay, So uh, I'm talking about that, uh, uh, of course, uh, human survival has to be thought of and environment, of course, has to be taken care of. And it is, as I said, that environment will automatically take care of itself. It is we human beings who will get annihilated at the end of the day if we are not uh, giving enough attention to the environmental issues. I hope I have answered your question. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, just uh, another one another question. Ma'am, you might be knowing of this uh, company Monsanto. That pharmaceutical um, company. Really, I'm not... Uh, uh, okay. Ma'am, uh, last a, uh, a couple of years back, Monsanto was drawn into the Geneva Convention and uh, was charged with international crime okay. for and how okay. they destroyed the the green zone of uh, Iraq, where the uh, river basins of Tigris and Euphrates they were the most uh, what to say the rich fertile lands for the production of wheat for over the over the past 300 years, and they produced nearly 300 different varieties of wheat. Okay. So, was this a movement also led by okay. the environmentalists, or, or the, or there was some other people involved in uh, bringing Monsanto to the uh, jury itself? So 
I'm actually not uh, very familiar with this one central issue because, as I said, that these uh, environmental issues they can be found in in each and every region uh, at the local levels, even within countries. Okay, so like there are uh, hundreds of things which are going around. So uh, this particular issue that you are talking about, I have not got across this one. Okay, so uh, of course, um, uh, like as you said, uh, that these. Uh, uh, High, these big companies, be it pharmaceutical companies or be it these chemical companies, how they are destroying uh, the river basins, they are destroying the, um, uh, turning the uh, fertile land into wasteland, as in in Carson's Carson's uh, book, uh, The Silent Spring. Okay, so of course, these are the things because essentially this whole race for progress, this whole uh, talk about uh, that, when, and particularly, of course. Uh, if we talk about carbon footprinting, it is the Western countries, the developed nations, who are responsible for the maximum uh, carbon footprinting. So they have already achieved, or they have the kind of uh, uh, use of uh, um, oil and um, petroleum that they have done. India is nowhere near that. So uh, these develop these developing countries, they also think about when West is utilized so much of uh, nature and its um, uh, like the products byproducts of that. Why not the developing countries? So that is like going into a whole another level of debate. So uh, of course, uh, environmentalists. Uh, Early, they play a very important role in highlighting these issues because what happens that many such uh, reports they get published in um, maybe scientific journals or newspapers and things like that but literature how can it can bring about a real change because through the narrative through this evocative medium how it is able to reach out to thousands and lakhs of people so that is uh, how what my real intention is that um, many such problems they are occurring throughout the world and we are not aware of all of these issues and but if they are written by a writer what happens is that the this gives uh, an impetus to these issues and how the people there is a sort of an awareness that is created amongst people and the government they are pressurized to take again to take action against uh, any such uh, people who are uh, doing uh, harm to uh, the environment. Thank you, ma'am. You answered all my questions and queries. Welcome, welcome, Shabazz. Welcome, Shabazz. Amal Kumar is asking a question, ma'am. Uh, actually, he's asking regarding uh, Greta Thunberg. Okay. Uh, has she been able to uh, put an impact okay, on the okay, okay. environment? Bilkul, bilkul. And she's a teenage um, activist and how she has been able to uh, like um, make a sort, a sort of a change uh, in the mindset of the developed countries, particularly. Uh, Shristi ask, also, go ahead with the question. Uh, Shristi, uh, if you can unmute and ask your question. Are you there, Shristi? Um, she has typed, um, uh, ma'am, in the comment box. Uh, yes, yes, Is my voice audible, ma'am? Okay, yes, yes, you are audible, Shristi, go ahead. Yes, yes, now you are audible. Yes, Shristi, go ahead. A very good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, I was, uh, the entire lecture series was very interesting and uh, I was reminded of one of the poems by Shelley in which uh, Ode to the West Wind, in which he wrote that the West Wind was both the preserver yes, and yes. destroyer. So, what, according to you, I yes. just wanted to know what you feel like. Uh, is it a human uh, consequence that nature uh, turns out to be a destroyer, or it, it's just is of nature that yes, it, yes, wants, it has to act as a, a preserver? I just wanted to know what you feel about it. Thank you, ma'am. 
okay welcome shrishti and uh, so that was a lovely question and uh, you have made me remind you are, i'm reminded of also of this poem uh, by shelly o to the west wind and uh, like how west wind has is also acts as a, a, a preserver and a destroyer as well and uh, the destroyer to bring about a new change so of course as i said that uh, uh, nature uh, of course essentially by nature it has to preserve things but when uh, people are uh, unnecessarily interfering in nature and its processes and um, exploiting resources uh, how it has this in internal strength or that there is this inner thing uh, about nature which can turn things on as in both of these novels you find that it they end up with cyclones and storms and how nature reclaims itself so because nature has the tendency to restore and this uh, destruction is for restoration for restoration to bringing back nature to its original glory okay so that is what i feel and as athi over here also in sara joseph's gift in green how athi all of this uh, these constructions that had taken place kumar and whatever destruction that he had done and uh, the destruction of the land that he had done so once these one uh, one nature once nature and its furies are let loose what happens ultimately when the calm is restored you would see athi in its uh, uh, primeval glory so to say uh, in its natural glory so this is how, this is how nature heals itself as uh, nowadays also in during these this lockdown period you must have often heard of this phrase that how nature is healing itself so nature has a process of healing when you destroy the forests when when you uh, like um, uh, in a way um, uh, embark on the spaces of the animals and the other creatures what happens nature hits at, hits back at you and finally uh, of course nature will somehow heal itself it is we who will get annihilated so for example in today's scenario we are suffering there is so much of uh, like this disease that is going around so it is human beings who are the, who are the sufferers of their follies okay and so we don't have to like how nature will heal itself and it is we who will suffer if we are not taking good care of nature and environment okay thank you ma'am i am looking forward to read those two novels about environment thank you Okay, welcome, most welcome. Uh, anyone else? And good reading for the lovely ones. Anyone else with the question? I think that no one is uh, uh, now. <laughs> no. Okay, I think. Uh, okay, uh, that was a wonderful session. Uh, yes. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, I, on behalf of Department of English, Karim City College, uh, extend my most sincere thanks, ma'am, uh, for uh, enlightening us with uh, the topic on co uh, contemplating environment issues through literature and eco-critical eco approach. Uh, it was really uh, wonderful, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, I also thank all the listeners who stayed. Thanks a lot, Sakesh. Thank you. So thanks a lot, Saket, and thanks a lot, uh, Yaya, also, and to the other all faculty members and students who are listening uh, patiently to my lecture. And uh, I look forward so, uh, to such uh, many more interactions. And it was lovely to have you as audience. And I, I hope that you all uh, benefit uh, from my lecture. It was a pleasure meeting you all. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am. Welcome, my pleasure. Yeah, yeah. It was my pleasure. Phone करता हूँ आराम से बात करता हूँ. Okay, okay then. Okay. Allah Hafiz. Okay. Bye, 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 everybody. Bye. Bye.